good to be back where it's hotter than it is in Dallas <laughs> but it, you know it all it's kind of all the same I don't know if it's uh, me as I get older or what but I never get climated to it you know well I want to speak on a subject tonight that is applicable to all of us redeeming our tongue the seriousness and the importance of our words. So you don't need to turn to these Scriptures. I have three. You may if you like, but you know them. You're familiar with them. The first is in Matthew 12, 36. I'll read it. Where our Lord said something very pungent and powerful and candidly kind of scary, sobering. Whenever I read it, it always strikes me. Especially one of these verses. Matthew 12, beginning the second half of verse 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now that's true for every one of us. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. Here's the one that always shakes me and makes me praise God for justification. But I say unto you that every idle word, careless word, that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Praise God for the righteousness of Christ. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Isn't that a strange verse? By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And then one verse in Ephesians 4, verse 29, Paul's exhortation in the context of <clears throat> um, being not quenching or grieving the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If we took that seriously, we'd keep our mouth shut twice as much so we wouldn't speak words that are unedifying. All right, and then the last one is a prayer of David at the end of of Psalm 19, which more and more I pray more frequently. What an amazing prayer this is. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in Thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. When we go into a time with lost family members, we ought to pray that. When we go into a, a conflict, a discussion, when we share the Gospel, when we potentially are fixing to have an argument with our mates, when we are correcting our children, what a prayer it is to pray, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in Thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. More and more, the Christian must master the art of redeeming our tongue. It is an art. The art and path of living the Christian life largely is learning how to manage our remaining corruptions and putting sin to death. Proverbs, this is amazing, Proverbs describes that it is more challenging to control our spirit than the work and skill of a military general. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. To capture a town in war, Solomon said, is possible uh, for men without supernatural grace or strength. But only divine grace can enable believers to govern our spirit and sanctify our speech in redeeming and sanctifying more and more our tongue. How is your speech day in and day out? 
Does it reflect the Holy Spirit? Does it reflect godliness? Does it reflect truth? Or does it reflect irritableness, rudeness, hastiness, interrupting people? One of the pet peeves I have, probably because I've done it over the years, and my wife has said, Honey, do you realize you were interrupting him? No, I wasn't. Yes, I was. And one of my pet peeves is people watching people interrupt others. We ought to learn how to be good listeners and make sure someone has finished speaking before we speak. But how we speak reflects much about us. And that, Solomon says, is harder than a successful military maneuver. Maurice Roberts, a Scottish pastor, said, the best Christian, the most fruitful Christian, is the one who manages his soul and most seriously kills the serpent of pride with the sword of mortification. James says, no man can tame what? The tongue. But I want to tell you what, we can't, but the Holy Spirit of God can more and more tame our tongue. And it's a great res responsibility and need. When the Christian, I believe this, when a Christian comes to the end of their pilgrimage, one sin we will regret will be idle speech, careless speech. Now it's assumed that no true Christian allows himself to continue in outward sins. Adultery, fornication, drunkenness, immorality. But the true Christian desires freedom from all inward sins too. Sins of the mind, inward thoughts, and even, yes, the use of our tongue. I was converted when I was 19 uh, the summer after my first year of college. And my first job as a Christian was working in a, in a uh, service station pumping gas when gas was 19 cents a gallon. How about that? And fixing flat tires. And I, a hammer or a tire tool hit my hand hard one day and I let out. I was a Christian about two weeks probably. I let out a curse word. And suddenly my conscience and my heart as a Christian hurt more than my hand was hurting. After that, I never uttered another curse word after that. And that's been 45 years. God does change us. Is He changing your speech? What a shame a Christian feels or should feel when he spoils his example and his testimony by speaking foolishly. And we can spoil our testimony by speaking foolishly. Our children hear us teach a Bible lesson or sing the praises of God, and then the next morning we're speaking harshly to them. We've damaged our testimony before them as a believer. The tone and language of our conversation day in and day out gives us a fair idea of how sanctified we truly are. Jesus said, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Now what in the world did He mean? Well, if He meant anything, He meant this. Our regular words, what comes out of our heart in our speech, reveal our true heart and character. Our words justify us. They declare about us what's true inside. They reveal the state of the heart. Our words are the thermometer of the heart. If words reveal that a person is unregenerate, and they often do, don't they? People at work, your neighbor, unconverted relatives. When you hear some of them speak vile words, harsh words, angry words, curse words, and that's always coming out of their, their mouths, it's a reflection. That person, they can't know God. So if words reveal that a person is unregenerate, and they often can, do they not also reveal the degree of a Christian's growth and holiness? They can. All believers, someone said, speak the language of heaven. 
but not all speak it consistently or fluently. Is your language heavenly? Meaning godly, humble, gracious, kind, patient, loving. I want you to just, just soak in for a minute how much Proverbs speaks about and warns about our words. You know, there's a chapter pretty much for each day of the month, and I try to read the chapter of the day, but it always strikes me. Solomon, a large part of Proverbs is he contrasts the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. But often he's contrasting good words and bad words. The words of the godly, the words of the foolish or the wicked. Proverbs, words of the foolish and wicked. Proverbs 11.13 A gossip reveals secrets. Pause. Do you reveal secrets? Do you tell other things because you want to pass on information and thus you separate friendships? A gossip reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. Proverbs 12, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are His delight. I have seen, some of you have seen, entire churches divided and destroyed through words. As Paul Tripp calls it, the war of words. Proverbs 16, A perverse person sows strife. How? With their words. And a whisperer separates the best of friends. Proverbs 17, Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. And let's just acknowledge, how does strife generally come? Words. If we kept our mouth shut, we wouldn't have an argument. He who controls his spirit is better than the military general. Proverbs 17, The beginning of strife is like releasing water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. Godliness learns to keep its mouth shut. Hold your tongue and prove yourself to be wiser than you really are. Proverbs 29, A fool utters all his mind but a wise person holds his back. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered wise. Back about 30, I don't know, 40 years ago, I was preaching. No, it wasn't that long. 36, 37. I was preaching in a nursing home in Dallas every Sunday afternoon. There was an old man on the front porch of the nursing home Always there Sunday afternoon. I'd always invite him to come in for the service. Always had the same reply. No, nope. Billy Graham's a hypocrite. I don't go to church. And I, I never knew what to say. Answer not a fool according to his folly, right? So I just kept my mouth shut. I'd invite him every week. Finally, I invited him again one day. And same answer. You know, Billy Graham's a hypocrite. That's why I don't go to church. And suddenly, I looked at him and I said, Sir, you know, if you'd pray for him instead of criticizing, he might do better. He said, Touche, preacher. <laughs> Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. You know, those two verses are side by side, aren't they? So there's a time to speak and there's a time to hold your tongue. Words of the wicked. In contrast, Solomon talks about the words of the righteous. Proverbs 10, The mouth of the righteous is a well of what? Life. But violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Proverbs 10, Wisdom is found on the lips of him, the one who has understanding. The lips of the righteous feed many. Do our words produce life and feed others? That's the test. Proverbs 12, He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Proverbs 13, He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his, wide his lips will have destruction. 
Well, my, one of my sons, a while back, it's been, I guess, several years, he came home from college and he had a black eye. I said, what happened? He said, well, I was in this bar and grill and this guy was, was mouthing off to us and, and uh, treating this girl wrong. So, so I just spoke to him and he hit me. And I said, well, you know, the mouth of the fool calls for blows. That's what Solomon said. Now, you may have been right to defend her, but I said, you've got to watch your words, don't you? He learned a lesson. I don't think it's happened since. A soft answer turns away what? Wrath. Wrath. Anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. You get the point. The words of the pure are pleasant. So death and life truly are in the power of the tongue. Still believe that even if Joel Osteen quotes that verse. It's still true. They don't get it right. They don't interpret it right. But death and life are in the power of the tongue. They bless others. Our tongues bless others and edify them. Or our words hurt and tear down and pierce like a sword, Solomon said. Talking words. Now we all talk wrongly at times. And one reason we talk uh, idly so much is that's all the world does around us out there. Idle words, foolish words, filthy words, worldly words, trivial speech. You know, I praise God that I'm not an unregenerate talk show host who talk for a living, spout out prideful foolery. Even the conservative guys admit it. They spout out oftentimes prideful, foolish, conservative talk. But they don't have God in their thoughts at all. And it's a, there's a great reckoning coming in the day of judgment about trivial speech and carnal talk. We are bombarded with it in our lives regularly. The world teaches us to talk, if we're not careful, to talk endlessly about nothing. Mastering the art of trivial, idle words. Maurice Roberts said, It is to be feared that the Lord has too few disciples who study to imitate Him in His words. Now this is a heart issue, brethren, isn't it? It's not just a matter of our being smart enough or careful enough or thoughtful enough to catch our words before we say something we should, out of the heart, proceeds our words. Our words flow from the heart. J.C. Ryle said, Our words are the evidence of the state of our hearts, as surely as the taste of water is an evidence of its source. A tender heart speaks tender words. A kind heart, kind words. A loving heart speaks lovingly. A judgmental heart speaks judgmentally. A hateful heart speaks hateful words. An impatient heart speaks impatiently. An unthankful heart never expresses thanks. The unclean tongue reflects an impure heart. Because the heart cannot be pure when the tongue is sinning. As John Lilly said, the tongue is the ambassador of our heart. And it reflects what you and I are inside. Someone has said, the tongues of sinners are always attacking and tearing down others, especially God's children. I was preaching in Canada a couple of months ago, and the, prime, the new Prime Minister of Canada is a blatantly, blatantly evil, wicked man. The Canadian pastor said, far worse than Obama was. And he recently publicly said, the greatest threat to Canada today is evangelical Christianity. Psalm 31.20 speaks of God protecting His people from the strife of tongues. 
And let's just admit it, to live in a fallen world means to be in an arena of strife, right? There's always a potential of words causing misunderstanding, hurt, bitterness, anger, and words do pierce like a sword. The Bible's theology of the tongue is far bigger, far greater, and more important than we realize. And we must pay, as a Christian, careful attention to our words if we want to truly live for Christ. Now, think about it. James says the tongue is a fire, right? The tongue like a match dropped on the ground in summer or like a spark from a campfire can set a forest fire. A spark, a match, can burn thousands of acres and hundreds of homes. And our, our tongue can do the same. It can do great destruction. We don't even realize it. Something is repeated because we want to tell somebody something. Our words... Stop there. But the one we repeated something to goes and does damage and damage spreads. Our tongue can sing the praises of God one day and criticize people the next. Someone said, nothing is so open more by mistake than our mouths. And it's really true. Actions don't speak louder than words because our Tongues can destroy all that we do. So we must learn to do two things with our tongue. First, how to hold it. I don't mean grab it physically. I mean, don't, don't use it. Don't speak. Be quiet instead of speaking. How to hold it. And secondly, how to use it. How to be silent when we should. When you don't have anything to say, say nothing. But oftentimes we... We don't think we have nothing to say. We think we have something that should be said. Learning the science of wise words. The great science of silence because nothing is often a good thing to say. Stop quarreling. Stop a quarrel before continuous starts. Think about this too. The Lord Jesus Christ, the world, when He was here, the world's words attacked him viciously. The only perfect man who ever lived. And there was nothing to criticize, was there? Perfection in his actions, his choices, his words. He never said a wrong word. He never said a word that was, that it was not perfect for the moment. And yet the world consistently, viciously, increasingly attacked him. He was blasted by with the most severe hateful accusations and lies. Words that came against Him. He breaks the Sabbath all the time. He's trying to overthrow Rome. He performs miracles by the power of Satan. He deceives the people. He's breaking the traditions of our fathers, even directly to His face. You have spoken blasphemy. He's guilty of death, even on the cross. Come down from the cross and save yourself. Words. Every kind of verbal stabbing and cruelty he suffered. And don't think he didn't feel it. It hurt. He was a true man with true emotions, true feelings. And Psalm 69 and Psalm 31 and Psalm 38, Messianic sections, Talk about this. Psalm 69. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart. But he turned a deaf ear to it all. He rose above it. He ignored it. He kept a wise silence. Psalm 31. I have heard the slander of many, but I have trusted in you, Lord. What if we learn to do that? Something cruel something rude, something harsh, something that's a potential argument is said to us? What if in our hearts we first said, Lord, I trust in You. Right now, let the words of my mouth be pleasing to You. 
learning by the Spirit to mortify our tongue and speak words of life that are healthy. Psalm 38, I as a deaf man heard not. The Lord Jesus turned a deaf ear to His enemies who were warring Him and attacking Him with words. Our Savior willfully turned a deaf ear to the bloodthirsty words of His haters. And Peter says when he was reviled, what? He reviled not. He did not reply back, but he con committed himself to Him who judges righteously. Some of you may remember 17 years ago in 2000, the year 2000, a Greek ferry boat sank and 82 people drowned. It happened because the captain left the vessel on autopilot and he did not control the ship, the boat himself. Afterward, he made all kinds of excuses about the accident, and he wouldn't accept personal responsibility for piloting the boat. Now, here's a question. Do you pilot your tongue, or is it on autopilot? Do we control our tongue or does our tongue control us? James says this very thing, large ships driven by strong winds are guided by a small rudder wherever the pilot wants to direct the ship. So even the tongue is a small member and we must turn our tongues the right way, in the right path, in the path of wisdom. The tongue must be controlled so our life is under control. As Nancy DeMoss said to ladies, your husband, husband doesn't make you say wrong things, you choose to say them. Because he just irritates you and gets under your skin. Your children don't make you say irritable and harsh words, you choose to. What's the difference between saying, Dear, I told you not to do that. And, I told you not to do that. What's the difference? Same words, far different result, right? That coworker, that prideful, arrogant, rude coworker at work, doesn't make you say negative things about them to others. We choose to when we could say nothing. I was told that one Pentecostal preacher read my book on Leonard Ravenhill and he criticized it because I didn't write enough about the Holy Ghost. Well, suddenly this reply came to my mind, my thoughts, but I chose to give no reply. The Lord checked my heart because you know what would have motivated me to speak? Defensiveness. How often do we speak out of defensiveness, irritation, impatience, pride? We choose or we don't choose our words. Our tongues are the primary steering wheel that drives our lives. And only as the Holy Spirit continually renews our mind and sanctifies our speech, will our tongue be tamed? Remember that commercial, what's in your wallet? What's in your mouth? What comes out when you're stuck by others? I think, I forget who it was that said about John Bunyan, if you stuck him anywhere, he bled the Bible. Well, when people stick us with words or wrong actions, what comes out of our mouth that reflects the current condition of our heart? We greatly need help, don't we? But the great reality is great help is available from the One who sympathizes with us, who always spoke in a good way. He knows how to help us improve our words. He will continually help us and change us and strengthen us and establish us even in our speech. David's prayer in Psalm 39 ought to become our, our prayer. This is an amazing thing. Psalm 39 
Verse 1, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. Taking heed to my ways. I'm going to seriously consider how I speak. And I'm going to make it a mark of my life that I examine. I'm going to take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Maurice Roberts said, Let every true Christian seek refuge in God's promises when tempted to answer back to those who speak sinful words to them. Because Scripture promises, Lord, You will keep me back from the strife of tongues. Now let me give you in closing some practical suggestions. Just a couple. How do we, what do we do to improve our tongue? Yield our members daily, consciously, as instruments of righteousness, as Romans 6 tells us. But think about this. Read the Bible more seriously in light of what it says about our words. Proverbs, Psalms, the Gospels, Paul, Peter. Read the Bible more consciously, more seriously about what it says about our speech and take it to heart. Be serious about it. Be humble. Acknowledge, Lord, I'm far from speaking the way I could, the way I should speak. Read the Bible more seriously in light of what it says about our words. Secondly, when believers meet together, they should try to lead one another's thoughts toward Christ. When you have a fellowship meal, do you take the conversation to the sermon, to the Scriptures? Conversations after family stuff and babies and parenting and work Get on to spiritual subjects. J.C. Ryle said there are too many believers who when they're together, add nothing to one another. Turn the subject to spiritual things. Across the table, brother, how's your week been? Are you encouraged in the Lord? What's God spoken to you this week? Turn the conversation to that which is edifying. Number three, Take Ephesians 4.29. Let no communication proceed out of your mouth except what is edifying. Take Psalm 19.14. Let the words of my mouth. Take these seriously and literally. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations, the thoughts of my heart please You. You pray that regularly. God's going to answer that. He'll change your tongue. He'll tame your tongue. He'll sanctify your speech because He's working in your heart and out of the heart proceeds the issues of life and out of the heart proceeds our words, right? Let me close with Malachi 3.16. I love this verse, Malachi 3.16, because there's a special blessing attached to godly conversation. Malachi says, Then they that fear the Lord, what's the next phrase? Spoke often to one another. Then they that fear the Lord spoke often to one another, and the Lord heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before Him for them that feared the Lord. Our Father in heaven, our blessed Savior, the Spirit of God who's in us and with us, hears and knows every word before we speak it. And if we Christians took more seriously our words with one another in the fear of the Lord, we would enjoy much more of God's presence among us. How is the thermometer of your heart in your life right now. Your words. Your speech. George Mueller, one of his 
worst outward sin before he was a Christian was stealing. He was a thief. And God transformed him and so changed him that ultimately Mueller cared for 2,000 orphans at one time and God provided. This is 19th century, the equivalent of $75 million flowed through his hands to care for those orphans. It doesn't matter how poor or how much of a struggle or how unexemplary your speech is. I'm telling you tonight, you yield your life afresh to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you go to Him and you say, Holy Spirit, change my speech. Sanctify my tongue. And let the words of my mouth be pleasing to you more and more. And you keep praying that. And you walk in the fear of the Lord. And you, you put a bridle on your tongue when you're before the wicked. And you learn to stay quiet and not say something when you're tempted to speak it. May God help us more and more to redeem our tongue and speak in a way that will please and glorify our Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven,